Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and Jerry's over there, and we're cubing it up with Rubik the Cube. <laughs> Did you see um, that cartoon, Rubik the Amazing Cube? Did you come across that? No. Okay. I, I feel like we are um, well within our rights as far as fair use goes since we are talking about this to at least play the highly disturbing but also strangely cute voice of Rubik, the amazing cube. Can I play this real quick? Sure. Okay. My name is Rubik. That is it. Wow. And it is awfully unusual, especially when you see this cube. They just basically took a... Do you remember the goblin face on Maximum Overdrive on that on the front of that semi? Mm, sort of. It's kind of like a cuter version of that that they put onto a Rubik's Cube, put some feet on it, and then gave it superpowers. That's Rubik the Amazing Cube. Wow. So back to Rubik, Chuck. Yeah, it, it, it was kind of hard to believe that it took until 2014 for this thing to be uh, granted National Toy Hall of Fame inductee status. Mm-hmm. Uh, it seems like it would have been much sooner than that because uh, they have sold hundreds and hundreds of millions of Rubik's Cube since 1980. I had one. I still have one. I could do it at one point. Oh, really? Yeah, I could do it in a couple of minutes. Wow, Chuck. I'm impressed. I had no idea. Yeah, I can still do, I can still do one side and like the top row surrounding that side on all sides. And that's where I completely forget. Oh, I see. So you couldn't do it in a couple of minutes now. You just have, you could in the past? Yeah, when I was nine. Okay, well, um, I'm impressed. I've never been able to solve a Rubik's Cube. I've never been sucked in enough to, um, like, really spend a significant amount of time. But um, I, I was playing with my um, niece's Rubik's Cube the other day, yeah. studying for this. And um, it, it, I was like, yeah, I could see how somebody would become obsessed with this kind of thing for sure. Yeah, it was fun. And it was, you know, to call it all the rage is an understatement. It was yeah. one of the most popular toys of all time. Invented in 1974 by a math enthusiast in Hungary, an architect, mm -hmm. a professor named Erno Rubik. Appropriately enough. They named him after the cube. That's right. And if you don't know what we're talking about, <laughs> it seems weird to describe a Rubik's Cube, but we'll probably be taking the task if we do not. Uh, I would say just uh, come out from under the rock that you've been living under. <laughs> but we may have some young listeners who don't even know what this thing is, uh, this piece of 80s ephemera, even though it's not ephemera because they're still pretty popular. Yeah. But it is a cube made up of 26 little mini cubes called Cubies, which is mm -hmm. kind of a cute little name. I think so, too. Not as cute as Rubik the Amazing Cube, but, yeah. Little cubies. And they are in a 3-inch by 3-inch by 3-inch, uh, well, that's not quite true, a 3 by 3 by 3 grid. Right. Uh, eventually creating a cube that measures 2.25 uh, inches or 5.7 centimeters per side. Right. And so, what, there's six, six cube faces, because it's a cube, and each face has a different color. There's orange, blue, green, yellow white and red and um when you when you mix these things up it's a, just a jumble a riot of different colors like you've never seen in your life but the point is to move these cubies around through the 18 different ways you can move any given cube um so that all of the colors are lined up all the colored cubies are all the same on each face and it sounds easy friends it is not easy not at all. Like, maybe for some people it's easy, but for the rest of us normal folk, us normies, it is not easy in any way, shape, or form. No, it is not. Uh, and in fact, they even suggest that you read about how to solve the Rubik's Cube. It is yeah. a, the very rare individual that can literally just figure it out without any help at all. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's really tough to do. So it's not like you're not a cheat if you look at, like, how to solve the Rubik's Cube and then memorize these patterns and practice them. That's sort of the point. Right, yeah, like go look it up. Like it's fine. No, no one will, will get mad at you for that. Yeah, because it's no fun to never solve a puzzle. 
Well, that's why I think I've never gotten sucked in. I was like, I'm not even, there's no way I'm, I'm going to possibly stumble across this. And I just don't think like this. My spatial reasoning is yeah. terrible. I'm not great at math. I'm colorblind. Everything just looks white. It's um, not the toy for you. <laughs> no, it's really not. I can't discern squares from from circles. It's just I'm off. <laughs> so um, originally, the Rubik's cube was called the Magic Cube, and it was invented, like you said, by Erno Rubik, who is Hungarian. So it was originally called the Bivish Kotska, which is uh, Magic Cube in the Hungarian. And Kotska means butthead, I believe. It does. The magic butthead so is what it was originally it's called. The beavish and butthead. <laughs> oh, right. Nice, man. It's like, where's he going with this? After all these years, still, I, I, still it's didn't get great. That one. <laughs> no, I didn't. But I was like, I'm, I'm going with this. We'll uh-huh. go with this. It's Chuck. I trust him. <laughs> and it paid off, too. So Mr. Uh, Rubik got the, his Hungarian patent uh, on the mechanical design of this in 1977. And it was in Hungary only for a while. Uh, and it did pretty well in Hungary, um, but that's kind of where it stayed. It was, uh, it was because of the politics of the time and the fact that it was Hungary. It was not super easy to get a, uh, an American patent or to bring it over and market it here in the West. So it was pretty much a Hungarian local sensation for its early, like, probably first year. Yeah, he had like a, a Hungarian toy manufacturer make like 10,000 of them, but he wasn't happy with them, so he cut the runoff at 5,000. So there were 5,000 of these things floating around Budapest and, and maybe Hungary in general. And it was just total serendipity that there was a guy named Tibor Laxi, and I'm quite sure that's not exactly how you say his last name, I but that's, that's how, right. it's, how it's spelled. It's probably like Lucia or something like that. <laughs> but um, Tibor, I'm, I just love that name. It's a great name. Um, he was an entrepreneur who had uh, left Hungary and moved to Austria. So he had really developed a taste for capitalism. Well, he happened to be visiting back home in Budapest when he was at a restaurant and he noticed a waiter playing with the Beavish Kotska, the magic cube. And um, he said, you there, what is that? And uh, he said, well, it's the Beavish Kotska how about I sell it to you for a dollar? And I believe he bought that for a dollar, played around with it for a minute. It was like, this could be big. So he found out who invented it and he scheduled a meeting with Erno Rubik. Yeah. And he would say later on uh, that he, that Erno Rubik had a lot to do with why he decided to get into business with him. Uh, Mm -hmm. Here's his quote. He said, when Rubik first walked into the room, I felt like giving him some money. He looked like a beggar. He was terribly dressed. Uh, You got to remember this guy's a professor. So they're not known for their sharp attire. Right. Uh, he was terribly dressed, and he had a cheap Hungarian cigarette hanging out of his mouth. But I knew I had a genius on my hands, and I told him we could sell millions. Yeah. And he was right. Oh, man, was he ever right? He understated it, actually. Um, the uh, Tibor, I'm just going to call him Tibor. He took this um, magic cube, and he started going to toy fairs. Uh, and I think he struck out at a few of them, but he really hit it out of the park at the Nuremberg Toy Fair when he met a toy expert who uh, had connections with Ideal Toy Company. You remember Ideal back in the day? Uh, I, I think I do, for sure. I'm pretty sure they made that, um, the, uh, the, uh, oh, what was the Daredevil's name? Evil, Evil Knievel. Knievel. I think they made the Evil Knievel stunt bike. You know, what's funny is, um, they make those now for other. Uh, they have there's like an Incredibles stunt bike with uh, Plastic Girl. Oh, really? And it's the same exact function. We have one in our house, and you sure. load it up and crank it, and there she goes. Is it the exact same mold? They just put like different paint on it or something like that? Because <laughs> no, I love knockoff toys, it, man. It's slightly different uh, in its design, but it's clearly like the same exact toy. So at the Nuremberg Toy Fair. Uh, Tibor runs into uh, the guy from Ideal, and they end up purchasing it. They purchase the the rights to this, the global rights, and they 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 basically sign up to create a million Rubik's cubes. Yeah. Also, we should say at this toy fair, he he did a pretty smart thing. Instead of like mm-hmm. buying a booth, mm-hmm. he just came and worked the floor with Rubik's cubes. Yeah. And got this like ground buzz going by walking around and giving these things to people. And, like, that's genius. Like, for something like this, that's the perfect way to pique someone's curiosity is not to have some flashy, uh, 
like spinning giant Rubik's Cube is to actually get it in the hands of people walking around the floor. Right. Especially if you say, I'm Tibor, let's party. <laughs> he should, I, I bet he wanted to call it Tibor's Cube. It's a pretty good name. He probably did. Although he was smart because, remember, originally it was called the, um, the Magic Cube. At some point, if it wasn't Tibor, it was Ideal who said, we're going to rename this the Rubik's Cube. And I'm sure Erno Rubik was like, oh, well, okay, I guess if you insist. I wonder if he was into it or not, or if he pushed for it, or if he was like, I'm not really into that, but if you think it'll sell cubes. Uh, that's what I'm guessing he probably did. He I don't think look. he was going to stand in the way of it, yeah. but he was not like vying for it by any means. I, I, that's my impression, but I'm just totally making that up. Uh, but that, I have the same impression, which yeah. means that if you put our two impressions together, it equals fact. <laughs> <laughs> So Ideal sells 100 million Rubik's Cubes in the first two years, in 1980 yeah, remember, and 81. They just signed up to sell 1 million. They sold 100 million in two years. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they had problems keeping up with production. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the accolades in 80 and 81, it won the UK's Toy of the Year Award, two years running. Um, in 82, there were five books about solving it on the New York Times bestseller list, one of which I owned. I owned... Uh, the classic, The Simple Solution to the Rubik's Cube by James G. Norse. Cute. He was a chemistry student at Stanford. And get this, dude. This book was the number one best-selling book of 1981, period. Oh, my God. He sold 6.7 million books, and it is still the fasting-selling book in the history of Bantam books. Is that right? Can you believe that? Out of all the books that year, that was the number one. I can because that really kind of underscores just how nuts, the not just America, the world went for Rubik's Cube. That the number one selling book was a book about solving the toy. That, that, that was it. Yeah, they had sold 500 million of them by the time 1986 rolled around. So, so talking about the books, though, for another second, at one point, the number one, two, and four positions on the New York Times bestseller list were all Rubik's Cube solution books. Three was probably Stephen King or something. Probably. And uh, one of those books was written by a 12-year-old named Patrick Bossert called You Can Do the Cube, <laughs> which is pretty adorable if you think about it. And Christian Slater made a movie called Gleaming the Cube. One of my all-time favorites. Which had nothing to do with Rubik's Cubes, as it turns out. No, it's about skateboarding. That's right. Um, so there's a, a just a, a craze going on around the world. Like everyone is into the Rubik's Cube. Everyone's buying one. They sold like, I've seen anywhere from 350 million. The highest I've seen is 600 million. They sold a ton of these things, hundreds and hundreds of millions of them around Those were the, the official ones, too. There were plenty of knockoffs. Sure. There was books on the New York Times bestseller list about this. It was featured in Time, Scientific American, New Scientist. Um, there was a paper that was printed in the New England Journal of Medicine that talked about cubist's thumb, which yeah. is a real thing. It's a type of tendonitis in your thumb that you get in your non-dominant hand because that's the hand that you use to stabilize the Rubik's Cube. And so the edge of the cube pressing into the heel of your thumb where it meets the rest of your thumb, um, that could create tendonitis for people who were staying up for days on end just playing with this thing, trying <laughs> to, to beat this puzzle. Right. It was a craze like, like no other. I say we take a break. Okay. Uh, and we come back and we talk about uh, Mr. Rubik, or maybe he's a doctor. I'm going to call him Dr. Rubik. Okay. And how he created the mechanics of this puzzle. Right, so supposedly, uh, Doctor Rubik, surely he's a doctor. I would <laughs> let's call him Professor Rubik because he was definitely an architecture professor and a math genius. Surely, okay. though, I'm I'm with you. He's got to be a doctor. All right, Professor Doctor Rubik uh, supposedly was not even trying to create this puzzle in 1980. I'm sorry, 74 when he first started out. Uh -huh. um, as legend has it, he was trying to create a mathematical model for 3D design class, which makes sense right. considering his job. 
Uh, other people say, no, he was just really the kind of guy that liked to tinker. He was fascinated by geometry and shapes, and he was trying to just solve a problem of, of mechanics in three dimensions. But according to the Toy Hall of Fame, uh, he was very much trying to invent a puzzle, uh, and that may just be folklore. Yeah, he, he knew what he wanted. He wanted to make this three-by-three three cube that was made up of smaller cubes that could all, like, interact and twist around. Like, he had the idea for the Rubik's Cube, which was step one. But step two was a doozy, and that was figuring out how to invent a mechanical solution yeah. to make this thing work the way he wanted it to. And apparently he was, um, the, there was a pretty good article on mental floss by a guy named Noah Davis who recounted that um, one day Rubik was walking down the Danube, alongside the Danube uh, in Budapest and looked down and noticed that there was just a, a pile of nice polished rounded river rocks and thought, I've got it. I've been thinking <laughs> about a cube Everything's got to be a cube, but what if I added a sphere to the mix too? And that these things rotated around a sphere that would give the freedom of motion that I need to make this thing work. And that was it. That 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 was the the solution to the puzzle, as it were. Yeah, I mean, if you're like me and probably lots of other kids in the early '80s, you took your Rubik's cube apart at some point. Did you? I never I never saw one until oh, really? I watched a video on this, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a screwdriver out in pretty short order and popped those <laughs> things apart. Uh, and it's kind of cool when you look at the, you know, when you take all those cubies out, you get down to the center, and those three axes, um, and they have, uh, each one is tipped with two opposing center cubies. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool looking, and then it makes sense how all these things fit together and how it works. Yeah, I, another way to think about it is just think about like a sphere, a ball. And then you've got six arms sticking out in, in, um, at right angles from it so that it forms a three-dimensional plus, plus sign. And at the end of each one of these arms is a cube, a colored cube. And though that's the skeleton of the thing. And then what, what Erno Rubik figured out was that that's all that needed to be attached to the center. You could make the other cubes attach to those, those face cubes, those center cubes. Cubies. Cubies. Um, you could make some cubes, cubies attached to those cubies and then other cubies attached to the other cubies, and then they will all kind of rotate around each other, but they're all really rotating on three different axes coming out of that sphere. It's a genius. Like, this guy has gotten, like, if he started a craze and is, a, 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 you know, kind of viewed as this great inventor for the toy, like math, physics, uh, architecture, um, in the in a number of different fields, he's viewed mechanical as, engineering for sure. Yeah, he's viewed as just a, a a god in some senses for for cracking this this problem and creating this three dimensional structure that actually works in in reality that people can learn and study from. That's right. So he's figured out this uh, the mechanics of it all. But it's still not a puzzle yet until he applies these colors. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what makes it a puzzle because, like we said to, at the beginning, the idea is that you have all the colors on each side matching one another. He applies these colored stickers all over, mixes and twists it up a little bit, and he's like, I've invented the cube. And then he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know how to solve the puzzle. Mm -hmm. So he actually had built this thing, stickered it up, and looked at it, I imagine with some level of accomplishment and then realize the the biggest probably uh, the hardest thing to do in this whole process still lay in front of him, which was because there were no books out at this point. Right. <laughs> he invented it. So he had to figure out how to solve his own puzzle and it took him a while. It took him a month from what I saw. Yeah. And I imagine he worked on this pretty much nonstop to figure yeah. this thing out. He he did, and he would like write down like the different different moves, combination of moves, which now they're called algorithms. Sure, um, it's just types of moves that if you do them in a specific sequence, will solve a specific jumbled Rubik's cube. Right. That's right. Um, so he wrote them down. He kind of uh, kept track of it, and that was like the first the first um, first time anyone had a kind of applied analysis to this. But it would not be the last. Obviously, as the New York Times bestseller shows. But the, the reason why it's so difficult to solve a Rubik's Cube just by happenstance is that just the sheer number of possible configurations of the cube, right? Each face has nine cubies. 
and there's six um, faces. So there's 54 cubies, but they all relate to one another. And so if you move one, that's one configuration. If you move it another direction, that's another configuration and so on and so on. And so with these 54 cubies, Chuck, are you ready for this? Yes. The possible number of configurations is 43 quintillion, 252 quadrillion, 3 trillion, 274 billion, 489 million, 856,000 possible configurations of a Rubik's Cube. Uh, Amazing. And one of them, one, is the right one, where all six faces are all the same color cubies. Just one. So just doing it accidentally, your chances are one in about 43 trillion that you're going to stumble upon that right combination. That's right. Which is pretty amazing, don't you think? Yes. And by the way, I think I said in there 54, there's 20 cubes. I believe there's 54 faces. Yeah, I mean, that's the deal. Each cubie has three sides or Mm -hmm. two sides. Right. Depending on if it's a corner or an edge or one if it's in the center. Right. So it's kind of confusing. But but nine times six, so nine nine squares or nine different colored squares times six faces is 54, I think. Yeah, 54 faces, 20-something cubies. <laughs> right. But this is how good at math we are. Man, it's, it's really because it's so funny because it's such a simple little thing. But mm-hmm. once you start really breaking it down, you're like, we could make this super confusing if we tried hard. For sure. But what people have figured out is that they're, they're like you may have like a 1 in 43 quintillion chance of stumbling across the right configuration by accident. But what people have figured out is that there are combinations of moves like, you know, um, uh, front, right, up, t- up twice, and then down. Yeah. That's, that's an algorithm. And if you apply that to a certain kind of scrambled, a certain configuration of a scrambled Rubik's Cube, it will bring it back to solved. And so people have spent a lot of time developing algorithms. And that's what Erno Rubik was originally doing when he was like, oh, if I do this, this, and this, it will make it right. solved. And he wrote that down. That's what's called an algorithm. Yeah. And I remember in the book, like each book had their own little shorthand, I guess. Mm-hmm. But I remember the one that I had, uh, it definitely had the algorithms all spelled out with, like, shorthand for what each move was called. Mm -hmm. So it would sort of look like a math problem made out of letters. Right, like I saw U for up and D for down, which makes a lot of sense. But then also, um, you can, you know, you can move something to the right. You can twist one of the rows of cubes to the right, but you can also twist it to the left, too. So I saw an apostrophe after, like, L apostrophe would be counterclockwise left. And then you can add a number, too, so you do that twice, which is really a 180-degree counterclockwise turn. So interesting. It really is kind of interesting. It, like, at first, you know, when I first um, went over this article the first time, just taking it in, I was like, oh, this is pretty neat. But the Rubik's Cube, I found, has many, many layers to it, and you can really keep going deeply into it, well beyond just playing with the, the cube, uh, and trying to, to solve it, like there's a lot of math involved. There's a lot of physics and mechanics involved. Uh, you, I mean, you can get as sucked into it as you like, buddy. Just try not to go insane like Erno Rubik did. <laughs> he did not. <laughs> when he set that, that building on fire <laughs> full of Rubik's cubes. He, uh, it's interesting, though, how big of a hit this became. Sort of, It flew in the face of a lot of um, like, sort of rules of the toy industry in that uh, it didn't make sounds. Um, it didn't have interchangeable parts. It didn't have things that you could sell along with it, like, you know, clothing. You couldn't, I guess you could dress your little Rubik's Cube, but then <laughs> you have a special relationship with it, I guess so. Right. You could dress it up and be like, I'm Ruby. Uh, it didn't have batteries. It was never like, well, I guess it appeared on a TV show. Was that a TV show? Yeah, it was It was a Saturday morning cartoon that came on right before Pac-Man, which was Honestly, one of the all-time great cartoons ever. Yeah, it just it wasn't marketable though, like you would think a toy would be. The mm-hmm. reason that it appealed and endured is because it is a real challenge, and you get a real sense of reward once you've done it. Right, and that and really hooks people. It really does hook people. And again, there's like not there's no shame in going and looking up algorithms to solve. Um, Rubik's Cubes, like just processes. And in fact, if you start doing any kind of research on Rubik's Cubes, you'll find like there's actually specific um, 
methods of attack that people suggest for for beginners to start with. There's one called the white cross method. Classic. Which is um, entails eating a handful of white cross <laughs> gas station speed. Just staying up, staying up for four <laughs> days until you <laughs> until you get done. No. It's actually you start with the edge pieces and then you move to the corner pieces, putting them all in place, and then you um, go on from there, starting with the white face of the cube. That's right. And uh, this toy was a big hit anyway, but it uh, it has endured uh, not because of stocking stuffers or uh, nostalgia, mm-hmm. but it has endured all these years later because of competition. Yeah. So let's take a break now, and we'll talk about speed cubing right after this. Well, now, when you're on the road, driving in your truck, why not learn a thing or two from Josh and Chuck? It's Stuff You Should Know. Stuff You Should Know. All right. Okay, so the Rubik's Cube comes out in the world, basically, in 1980. And the next year, the very next year, countries around the world were holding national championships for um, solving Rubik's Cubes as fast as you possibly could. It's called speed cubing. Yes, and then a year after that, they all got together, all the champions of the countries, for the very first Rubik's Cube World Championship in Budapest, which mm-hmm. is kind of cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what has kept people going for so long because they're, they're, people are still trying to beat these records. I saw a kid, and it's kind of hard to tell what the top times because they list the top times in these competitions. But I saw a kid on YouTube do it in like six seconds or four or five seconds. I saw one do it in 3.47. Yeah, I don't know how, like, how it's officially judged, though. There's a timer, um, and one of those there's one of those mats that you keep your hands on. Well, no, I get pressure. that. But like, why does it say that that those aren't world records? Then I don't know. That's what I saw. Was the world record was in 2018, and it was 3.47 seconds by Yu Shang of Yu Shang Du, sorry, of China. See, I've seen other things listed. I just don't know if there's like. The, the bodies aren't speaking to one another or what? <laughs> hmm. Maybe it's that was a um, a non-championship uh, time. Uh, and like so, a non-sanctioned event or, or even Or even maybe it was a qualifier or something like that. So it, it doesn't count as the world record unless you get whatever time is done at the world championship. That's considered the world record. Who knows? It's crazy to see how fast these kids, and it's usually kids that win. Mm. Um, I guess with their little nimble fingers and, <laughs> right. and brain sponges. Yeah. Uh, it's crazy how fast they're doing it. It doesn't look real. It looks like some sort of weird faked video. Yeah, and here's the other thing too. I'm glad you mentioned brain sponges because it is like a, um, a, a an intellectual pursuit. Like from the beginning of this this toy's release in 1980, like they, they went a different route. Like you're saying it, it doesn't require batteries. It was, you know, um, it, do, it doesn't make a noise or anything like that. So they went a different route in advertising it and said this is a, an intelligent game. Like, um, sure, Isaac Newton discovered gravity, but could he solve a Rubik's Cube, you know? So they really kind of play that up, and it's true because these kids who are solving, or people who are solving Rubik's Cubes super fast, it's not just like love or their fingers are just moving for them. They have memorized hundreds, if not thousands, of these algorithms and have gotten to the point where they can look at a cube and figure out which algorithm is going to solve it the fastest. And then when the time starts, they can also move their fingers really, really quick. And that's how they're getting these amazing times. It's not just speed and dexterity. It's also knowing what algorithm is going to work best. Yeah, for sure. Uh you know, it, it, it died out pretty quickly like most fad toys. Mm-hmm. Um, once you sell a lot of these, you don't need another one unless you break yours or something. So it's kind of one of those things where, and which is, again, why it flew in the face of the toy industry because they couldn't sell ancillary products alongside sure. it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it died out pretty quickly, and the championship uh, in 1982 was the last one for about 20 years mm-hmm. uh, until the Internet comes along. And all of a sudden, there are people posting faster times than ever before than 20 years earlier. And in 2003, 
um, in Canada, there was a speed cuber named Dan Gosby who organized uh, a competition in Toronto. Mm-hmm. And this is where they're getting it down to like 20 seconds. And they have different categories like blindfolded, fewest moves, one-handed, <laughs> feet. Feet. Feet, dude, last year. Someone did it in 23 seconds by foot, yeah. which was about the quickest time by hand at the first competition. Yes, and it took them longer to figure out that they had solved it than it did to actually solve it because they had to use a stick to turn the Rubik's Cube over because they had used their feet to solve it. <laughs> and I think uh, <laughs> when you participate... <laughs> it didn't pay off as well as I thought it would. Eh, it was all right. Uh, you get 15 seconds to look the cube over. Mm-hmm. Um, they are all started, uh, like the cubes are all started the same with a, like a computer-generated random 25-move scramble. It's just fair. You get that 15 seconds, you check it out, you set it on your mat, and then you you go. And it's just, like I said, it's amazing to see these things done in like sub four seconds. Yeah, because they're, they, I mean, their hands actually do kind of blur. Like you can't really follow where their hands are at any given time. They barely touch the Rubik's Cube. And they're using, to be fair, they're using specialized speed cubes. They're not just using like off-the-shelf Rubik's Cubes. Yeah, we'll talk about those. Or should we right. just go ahead and talk about them? It's well, amazing. Sure. Sure, yeah. So so people go to the trouble of getting a speed cube. It's like, you know, you can get one for you can get a good one from what I understand for about 70, 75 bucks. And these things are literally well-oiled machines that yeah. are just super fast. Some of them use magnets so that you can tell when they're snapped into place and um, they move a lot more easily and quickly. Um, they're, it, you could just look at it and be like, that's a high-end Rubik's Cube right there. Yeah, like you can pay to get your cube serviced mm-hmm. uh, and checked out at Speed Cube Shop. So someone will take it apart, a technician, and they will look at each of those little cubies for defects and, like, has it got a little bump here that will slow it down? They'll smooth that out. Uh, like you said, sometimes they use magnets. Um, and one of the reasons for the magnets is it creates that snap when a turn is completed. Because mm-hmm. if you want to move these things really fast, you don't want it to be... You know, if, even if it's an eighth of an inch out of whack, you're not going to be able to turn it the other way. Right. So you want it to snap and lock into place. Uh, you know, you want <laughs> – it's just amazing how how engineered these things have become yeah. in these speed cubing competitions. Right. Well, I mean, just to keep up, you've got to, you've got to get yourself a speed cube. If you showed up, like, to an actual competition with just a regular Rubik's Cube, you'd, I don't know if you'd be laughed out of the place, but they would – they would certainly feel bad for you. You know what they should do is like, because, you know, I remember them loosening up really well and getting faster just because you played with it more. Mm-hmm. Instead of giving everyone speed cubes and trying to get this ultra Red Bull record, which they sponsor the events now, by the way, yeah. uh, they should give everyone like out of the package, make it as hard as possible. I agree. I think that there would be some, um, you know, Preteens who are really high strung that would cry if they were confronted <laughs> with that challenge. If they had to put their speed cube down? Yeah, they'd be like, this is not fair. No one prepared me in my life for this. <laughs> uh, I did mention Red Bull because it was kind of controversial. Um, for many years, uh, the Rubik's World Championships uh, were co hosted by the World Cube Association with the, the support of the brand, but then clearly some money changed hands. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was the Red Bull Rubik's Cube World Championship. Uh, you know, Red Bull got involved. The brand Rubik got involved, which means there was money changing hands. And <laughs> You're every- really fascinated with that money changing hands, aren't you? Well, I mean, sure, because it was. I think everyone saw it as for what it was, which was sure. all of a sudden there's a corporate sponsor attached to it. Yeah, and I, that that is like a pretty important point because like this was there was already a world championship and it was like a grassroots organization that had grown up since 2003 and they were doing really well and then all of a sudden 15 years later, Red Bull comes along attached to the Rubik's brand and is like out of the way, nerds. This is the real one. Yeah. And so apparently um, it was a there was a lot of controversy, like you were saying, but um, now they kind of coexist, and the Red yeah. Bull Rubik's sponsored one changed their name from World Championship to World Cup, so that they don't step on each other's feet at all. But if you think about it, that's a pretty big win for this grassroots World Cubing Association to to be able to keep their original name and not have to change their name. You know, for sure. Hats off to them. Hats off, indeed. So. Um, one of the uh, the 
the things that I said about the Rubik's Cube, Chuck, is that it, it, it's got a lot of layers to it. And there's a lot of surprising math involved. Specifically, there's a, a kind of algebra called um, group theory. And um, one, of the, one of the things that has long kind of fascinated mathematicians is that there is somewhere in there a, a number of moves. There's an algorithm that has, or there's a number of moves associated with any number of algorithms. Man, I'm making this way harder than it actually is. Where it represents the maximum number of moves you would need to use to solve any configuration, any of the 43 quintillion configurations of a Rubik's Cube. And some people figured out that this number must exist. And brother, they got obsessed with it. From 1981 to 2010, some people almost set a building full of Rubik's Cubes on fire. Yeah, I mean, they really research this stuff to the point where, uh, like, computer scientists are looking into this. There was mm-hmm. a guy uh, named Thomas Rakiki um, who got that the upper limit down to 22 moves, and this is like Google is helping him out with the processing power. Yeah. So they call it God's algorithm. Uh, I mean, in the case of Rubik's Cube, um, they got down to 20 is where they landed, right? Yeah. But God's call- algorithm can be used for any puzzle, really. Uh, you know, and it, that is, and why do they call it God's algorithm? It's what how God would solve the puzzle. So, from what I saw, it's the God's God's number is the the maximum number of moves that God would require to solve any configuration of the puzzle. Right. So they Which call it God's number. Got a little confusing in this article because it's a bit of a brain trick. It's like the fewest moves. But it's a maximum number of moves. Right, right, exactly. It's it's hard to wrap your mind around. And then there's actually fewer moves for other algorithms. So I saw God's number is actually probably more like somewhere between 19 and 20. But because there are algorithms out there that have to be done in no less than 20 moves, that's still God's number. And there's also the devil's number I saw too, What's which that? is the number of moves in an algorithm that it would take to go through all 43 plus quintillion um, configurations before you oh, solve it, which I think that's a pretty good name for that one. Huh. Yeah, now that's the one that they're on the trail of now. But they're, they're done at 20, right? They are, but I think I think it's interesting that, that we're not entirely certain it's not like, okay, this has been proven, it's done. What The reason why they arrived at 20 is because they actually built an algorithm to try to solve these algorithms. Right. They taught an AI, basically, how to play Rubik's Cube, or they said, here is a Rubik's Cube, go teach yourself. And then they had it play just, just some mind-numbing number of different Rubik's Cube's hands trying to solve it. And it kept coming up with 20. And so it came up with 20 enough times that they're like, well, our computer God has told us that 20 right. is the is God's number. So there you have it. But we no one it wasn't proven, it wasn't solved. It was right. just like this thing is so so smart that we're just going to go with 20. So pit someone's still working on it then probably. I guess, but I think I get the impression that they have moved on to the devil's number. <laughs> <laughs> so as you would imagine with a toy of this caliber, uh, there were bound to be other people uh, saying they invented it and patent battles would ensue. Mm-hmm. And, of course, this was the case with the Rubik's Cube. Uh, in 1977, when uh, Rubik got his Hungarian patent for the Magic Cube, there was another inventor named Larry Nichols who had already patented something very similar in the U.S. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, this was in 1972, but his was for a 2 two by 2 by 2 cube, but not a 3 by 3 by 3 Still, same concept. Sure. And at first he was like, this is, this is hilarious. You know, I had the same idea and now it's become a national craze. It's kind of satisfying. And somebody said, do you have any idea how much money you are losing out on right now? You should sue. He said, oh my gosh, you're right. I should sue. And I get the impression that either the company he worked for or the company he sold the patent to really led the charge in suing for this uh, patent infringement. Um, but he had a pretty good case. I mean, he had invented it and patented it years before. It was just... The number of cubes involved was smaller. Yeah, I mean, there was another guy, too, a guy named Frank Frank Fox, uh, I think in 74. Mm -hmm. He actually did the 3 by 3 by 3 but he let his uh, patent lapse, whereas Nichols did not. And those people, like you were talking about, 
that he that actually owned Nichols Patent were called uh, Moleculin Research Corporation. That sounds scary. Yeah, and litigious. Yeah, yeah, they do. So the, I want to point out, though, it's definitely worth saying outright, there is no evidence, and I don't think anyone's ever leveled an accusation that Erno Rubik stole this idea. It, it was just arrived at independently, and he was working behind the Iron Curtain at the time, too. So the chances of any exposure are pretty low. It was just some people kind of came up with the same idea at the same time, and Erno Rubik's is the one that hit. That's right. Uh, in 1984, a federal district court ruled in favor of Moleculon, but then in 86, an appeals court overturned that, saying only that two-by-two-by-two by two by two, uh, Rubik's Cube, because they started making different variations. Mm-hmm. Um, they made a smaller one that they said infringed. And in fact, I remember now, I had a little guy on a car key for a short time. Oh, yeah, I remember those. If I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then in 1989, another appeals court upheld the previous appeals court decision. I should I should say I read an article by that guy uh, Nichols who had the original patent, and they were like you know you I think they were suing for like fifty million or something. And like, were you satisfied with the outcome? He said, Yeah, I was satisfied. He's like, I, I got enough to put both of my kids through Harvard, so I'm pretty happy with that. And <laughs> um, you know, like he invented this thing that he was able to to send his kid through Harvard with. You know, yeah, that's always that's interesting cool. when someone win something like that, but it wasn't, like, stolen from him. Right. It was just he had the patent first, and they agreed. You know what's what's even crazier that makes that story just absolutely insane? He had approached Ideal Toys with that, and they had not bought it. And then they went on years later to buy um, the the, uh, Erno Rubik version. Yeah, they put out a, a bunch of different ones. They made big ones, like the tiny ones I just talked about. I remember I had a snake. I did too, and I had no idea what to do with that. I just played with it like it was a snake. <laughs> I did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I just twisted it around and stuff. I still don't know what you were supposed to do with that thing. I think eventually the snake uh, would be put together in some sort of a three-dimensional octagon or something, if I remember. Okay. Or hexagon. Yeah, I was way off. But, uh, yeah, I didn't know how to – I didn't even try to learn. I just kind of played with it. I taught mine to drink water. <laughs> Mine drinks from a cup. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that was very Ralph Wiggum. Yeah. Uh, Erno Rubik is still alive and well. He lives in Hungary, mm-hmm. still teaches architecture. Uh, I imagine has a boatload of money, so he's founded some uh, multiple foundations yeah, which uh, is for cool. inventors. That's very cool. Yeah, he ha- he has a boatload of money, so much so that his success story is considered by some to have been the thing that opened the gates to uh, capitalism in Hungary. Amazing. Um, they also made him the president of the Hungarian Engineering Academy. And he still, I think, shows up once in a while to the world championships and maybe the World Cup. I don't know. He doesn't seem like a very controversial type. No, seems like a good guy. <clears throat> and if you really want to go crazy, if you've solved a ton of Rubik's Cubes, but this has kind of made you nostalgic to try something harder, they make a 13 by 13 by 13 Rubik's Cube. Oh, wow. And there's something else called the Skewb, S-K-E-W-B. And it is, I don't even know what you're supposed to do with it. It's like the snake times a trillion to me. That's right. And there's also a movie called Cube, which is like Saw with math. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. It has nothing to do with Rubik's Cubes. And there's uh, the Pursuit of Happiness, where Will Smith gets a job as a stockbroker because somebody sees him solve a Rubik's Cube in something like two minutes or less. And apparently, while he was promoting that movie, he solved one in less than a minute himself in real life. You mean the movie The Pursuit of Happiness? Yeah. I, did they explain that in the movie? I'm sure. I never saw it. I just always called it <clears throat> Happiness. <clears throat> did you ever see that one where he was, like, super depressed and his his colleagues at work, like, just gaslight him into thinking he's being visited by angels? No, I didn't. Oh. Did you see the one where he went, uh, he was from West Philadelphia and he went to live with his rich relatives? <laughs> yeah, I did. As That's a matter of fact, he dressed very colorfully. Mm-hmm. He was, uh, I think, in Bel Air. Uh, was mistaken. it Bel Air? I think it was Santa Barbara. Oh, you're right. Okay. Uh, well, if you want to know more about Will Smith, you can type his name into the search bar at HowStuffWorks.com. And since I said Will Smith, it's time for Listener Mail. I've got a coconut tree correction. 
Okay. Hey guys, correction on something uh, said during the episode, <clears throat> The Cult of the Coconut. When you guys talked about the Culpa Vrishka, first of all, it's not pronounced that way. Uh, it is pronounced Culpa Vrishka. Oh, we were way off. <laughs> <laughs> all right. She says uh, Vrishka or Vrishka, depending on transliteration, simply means tree in Sanskrit. Okay. Uh, also, always mispronounced by people in the West, by the way. Oh, uh, well, I don't feel that bad. Yeah, exactly. Correct pronunciation is uh, Sanskrit. No, she's saying Sanskrit is always mispronounced. Oh, oh, I see. So it's Sanskrit? Sanskrit. That sounds she said like a French person. As best I can convey, is what she says. Wow, okay. Yeah, I've always said Sanskrit. This person is a real, uh, really into words, though, and very okay. smart. Uh, second, the coconut tree is just one of the trees considered a, uh, how do you pronounce it again? Kalashkrufa? Kal, kol, Kolpukskrufka? Uh-huh. There you go. You <laughs> nailed it. Not because it is all you need to survive, though, but because every single part of the coconut tree is useful to humans. Oh, yeah. Uh, the bark, the leaves, the fibers, and, of course, the coconuts in their oh. entirety. Uh, this concept is tied closely with why uh, Indians culturally revere certain animals... Uh, e.g. cow, and plants and trees, e.g. banyan and coconut. Okay. I've noticed on the podcast how you two often go out of your way to correctly pronounce words or names in foreign languages like we German. We thought we were. <laughs> which is something I appreciate as a bicultural, uh, pentalingual individual. Wow. Perhaps you could expand your efforts to include not just Western languages, but Eastern languages too. After all, Sanskrit belongs to the same language group as German. If you think about it, I think it would be true to the spirit of your show, guys. Keep up the good work. And that is from Ruta, R-U-T-A. Did, did Ruta say, did she sign off with later lamos? <laughs> no. Thanks a lot, Ruta. Yeah, it's not like we're like, oh, we'll only go to the trouble of pronouncing something in German or French, which, by the way, we don't very often. And we thought we were pronouncing it yeah. correctly That's right. in the Eastern languages. So sorry, Ruta. I didn't know it was Sanskrit. Sanskrit. I had no idea. Not just us, Chuck. Like a million people just learned that. Uh, yeah. Uh, close to a million. I agree. Uh, well, thanks a lot again, Ruta. And if you want to get in touch with us like Ruta did, you can go to stuffyoushouldknow.com and check out our social links. Or you can send us a good old-fashioned email to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.